Welcome to our Portions Podcast, where we discuss the portions of Scripture that are being read in the synagogues around the world each and every week. The goal and desire of these podcasts are that you would not only learn and be encouraged by the Scripture, but also that your heart would be enlarged where Israel and the Jewish people are concerned. So I ask you to open your Bible and open your heart, and I pray that over the course of the next 20 minutes, that the God of Israel would meet us as we study His Word together. Hi, friends, and thanks again for joining us for another Portions podcast. I'm so blessed by the uh, encouraging words that I'm getting from people really around the world who are listening to these, and I just want to encourage you, if these podcasts have been a blessing, please share them with friends, download the app, have your friends download the app. These are free every week, and believe it or not, they encourage me to do them as much as they may encourage anybody who listens to them. Today's a special day. I've got my good buddy, Nathan Smith, with me. Nathan, thanks for joining us again on this podcast. Man, it's always a treat. Thanks, God. Yeah, so this is really cool, friends. We're actually in a car. We're driving from uh, Charlotte, North Carolina, to Auburn, Alabama, on a little bit of a road trip. War Eagle. War Eagle. That's going to turn off all of our Alabama friends. But listen, I am really blessed because as we've been driving, we've been talking about this particular podcast, and the title of this podcast is Viera, and he appeared. It's from Exodus 6-2 to the end of Exodus chapter 9, and Nathan, when it talks about and he appeared, would you just read the first verse of this section where it talks about God appearing, and I want to unpack this a little bit together for the people who are listening. Yeah, we get started in, uh, in Exodus 6, verse 2. It says, God also said to Moses, I am the Lord. Verse 3 says, I appeared to Abraham, to Isaac, and to Jacob as God Almighty, but by my name, the Lord, I did not make myself fully known to him. Wow. Okay, so let, let's just dive into this. Now, friends, if you've been with us, God truly made himself known as God. Like when I think of Abraham, Nathan, At a hundred years old, Abraham and Sarah realized that what God said he would do, he actually did. That's that's a miracle, dude. Abraham's a hundred. His body's as good as dead. Sarah's 90. Her womb is dead. The promised seed comes. So wouldn't you say that God did appear to Abraham and to Isaac and to Jacob? Oh, there's no question. I mean, really, the scriptures are one big revelation of who he is. So he's constantly revealing himself. I think it's fascinating that the passage, and it seems to convey that though he had revealed himself, he had not fully revealed himself. Yeah. There was aspects of his character that he already revealed clearly, of course, to the patriarchs, but that this is a, a special revelation, a, a next level feeling of himself. That's kind of what I've seen. Yeah, so the cool thing is, is that there was a whole aspect of of God's character that we're going to see beginning now and really for the rest of history. And friends, if you hear raindrops in the car, this is really raw. We're driving through a little bit of a rainstorm, so please don't mind that. You may not hear it. I'm not sure how it's coming through. But here's the deal, Nathan, and everybody that's listening. I think God will go to any length to reveal himself as the God who delivers as the God who is the promise keeper, and not only to the people who he's called, but to the ends of the earth. Nathan, as we were talking before we went uh, on the air, we were talking about the fact that God was not only going to reveal himself to his chosen people, Israel, but he's going to reveal himself to the Egyptians as well, which is a very, very powerful point. Can we can you talk about that just for a minute? Yeah, I just think it's so beautiful as we consider uh, even with what TFI is all about and just bringing awareness to God's special relationship with, with Israel, the Jewish people, but it's not because uh, he has favorites and he doesn't care about anybody else. He's got a specific purpose to reach the whole world. That's right. And so we see this exact same paradigm in these passages Uh, which are going to take us, we're going to see in the next few moments, into the plagues and the judgments that for most people, when you first think about it, you're just thinking about, you know, these amazing judgments and miracles and and wow, and, you know, God's going to snatch the Israelites out of Egypt and 
you know, he's going to punish the Egyptians. But you, as you see throughout the, the Parsha, he is constantly wanting to make sure that the Egyptians are seeing him as the Lord. Yeah. And you see that he actually takes care to make sure they're getting that revelation, even making sure they have provision at times in the midst of the plagues, because ultimately his heart is not to destroy them. His heart is to reveal himself, which I think is such uh, an, an appropriate thing with the Parsha being called Vaera, or and he appeared, and right. I appeared. He's wanting to reveal himself, and he'll go to whatever lengths he has to, to reveal himself, obviously to make things right, to bring justice and judgment, but not just to do that, so that he wants to reveal himself so the Egyptians can even know who he is. Yeah, that's incredible. So here, God has appeared to our patriarchs, Abraham, Isaac, Jacob. Uh, he, he makes a promise to them, but there is an aspect of God now where he's coming down, and he's going to be the God who really stands with those who call him their Lord. And that's an encouraging thing, friends. I really want to um, invite you into this portion of Scripture because you may be going things. There's a difference between those of us who go through things with the Lord in our hearts and those who go through things without the Lord. We have the revelation that if God will come down and fight, for his people, in the book of Exodus and throughout scripture, surely he will come down and fight for us. And there's nothing too big that you're facing today that the Lord can't handle. I know it's further on in the book of Exodus, but at some point God tells Moses and the people of Israel that all they need to do is be silent because he will fight their battle. So the Lord of hosts is the God who never loses a battle and he comes down and he fights for us. And may you be encouraged as we go through some of these uh, plagues even, that the God who exacts justice for his people also longs to see the nations of the earth saved. So Nathan, why don't you, why don't you just kind of lead us as to what happens beyond God saying now to Moses that he's about to reveal himself in a special way. Well, he, he lets us know he's going to reveal himself in a unique way. But though Moses has already let the Israelites know this is going to happen, we, we, we saw in our last Parsha that when he does that, Pharaoh gets mad, you got the whole the, the staff turned into a snake, and he's able to, the magicians are able to recreate that, that yeah. miracle, yeah. although God supersedes it by consuming the others. But what happens is, Pharaoh then gets mad and has them all have to work extra hard. Now right. they got to produce bricks without straw. And so when Moses goes in, in chapter 6 and reassures the Israelites that, no, God is doing this. I'm here to bring this word. It's going to happen. It actually says that though he reported in verse 9, Moses reported to the Israelites, but they did not listen to him because of their discouragement and their harsh labor. Yeah. And, and I think... For all of us that are, that are really experiencing this thought together, it's oftentimes that God brings a promise or encourages us. We get a word, we see something, there's encouragement, and it's tested immediately. And it's so easy for, easy for us to lose heart and say, <laughs> well, man, I mean, I just got this word, and actually things got worse. Yeah. So the Israelites are struggling in the same way we do and say, well, you know, that's awesome, but none of it's happening. Matter of fact, things have gotten worse, and they're not even kind of cheering Moses on. They're not even trusting God. They're feeling, in a lot of ways, defeated right. and deflated. And I think, you know, for those of us that find ourselves in those moments, we, all, we actually can draw some encouragement from their circumstances, realizing it really is a human response. Yeah, and I think, like for me, it seems like a pattern in Scripture, actually, if you think about it. God makes a promise. And the exact opposite of what the promise is ends up happening right. to us. When I mean, we talked about it with Joseph, he, you know, the Lord showed him that his brothers were going to be bowing down to him. The very next thing that happens is he's in a prison. God makes a promise to the children of Israel through Moses. The next thing that happens is Pharaoh turns up the heat, increases the, the labor, and it makes it seem like, it almost makes it seem like, a game where God's promise is made, and I, I shouldn't say a game, that, that's too trite, but it almost seems like we're put in a position of really having to determine that our circumstances are not the thing 
on which we hang our faith. Our faith needs to be hung on the promise that God made because many times, if not oftentimes, the circumstances are going to be directly contradictory to the very thing that God's promised us. So friends, please take heart. Hang on to God's promise and don't let your circumstances be the thing by which you measure the validity of God's promise. Let your circumstances be the thing that you smile at and you say, my God has made a promise and when God says I will, he means I will. So Nathan, I, I don't know how much time we've got left because I'm driving. You're the one that's looking at the clock. But let's, let's dive into the next thing that you felt was important just with our eyes also on the clock. How much time do we have, bro? Ten minutes. Okay, we got ten minutes. Let's do it. Yeah, so now we get into Aaron speaking for Moses as they approach Pharaoh, and uh, there's this kind of two witness thing, right? We see that as a pattern in scripture where uh, a thing is confirmed by two witnesses. So God's sending actually Moses and Aaron right. together, right. which just um, solidifies that whole two witness thing. Go ahead. Yeah, yeah. and so now um, they're approaching Pharaoh and they're, they're making these uh, kind of pleas to let the people go. And I think it's key, and some people miss the whole point. It wasn't just let my people go. Like that's kind of the famous Charlton Heston. You know, it <laughs> yeah. was let my people go that they may worship me. Yeah. And I think that's really what we're going to see in these plagues. Some of this is not only about deliverance, but it's a war over worship. Yeah. Recognizing that he is the God of gods. He is uh, Yahweh. He is Adonai, Seho, the Lord of hosts. This is the God of all gods. He is supreme. And so he's wanting his people to be set free so that all the promises he's made will take place, but he's wanting them to be seen as worshiping the God who is overall through all and in all. That probably had to tick Pharaoh off a little bit because Pharaoh's the one that wanted to be worshipped. And the gods of Egypt right. were the ones that wanted to be worshipped. So when, when you say, let my people go that they may worship me, as opposed to worshiping you, I'm sure, I am sure that Pharaoh was like, hey, wait a honk in second. Absolutely. Anyway, let's let's continue on, bro. So then we have the very first demonstration. Uh, Aaron throws down the staff. It becomes a snake. And then it says that Pharaoh summoned his wise men and sorcerers, and the Egyptian magicians did the same thing by their secret arts. That's in verse 11 of, of chapter 7. I think that's important for, for one, one thing, and that is we often can dismiss the fact that there is spiritual supernatural power. Yeah, right? yeah. Of course, God is the all-supreme, uh, I mean, cannot be touched, uh, God of God's overall God Almighty. But we can sometimes dismiss that there is supernatural power that the enemy will try to use to wow. counterfeit what God can do, wow. and even to mock God. And we see a picture of this that basically it doesn't say that Pharaoh hardened his heart until after he saw that his own magicians could do something similar to what Moses and Aaron did in saying, okay, you know what? You guys have this little party trick. That's fine. My guys can do that too. So you may have a God, but I'm a God, and we have gods. And so you know what? I'm not letting all my slave labor go just because you can do some supernatural thing. We do supernatural things too, so that's fine. But I think it's key that it says they did it by their secret arts. You know, the actual word occult, the root word it comes from, to cover, to veil, yeah. to be secret. And oftentimes the enemy tries to use his smaller power, which is supernatural, to distract people or to wow. mislead people wow. from opening their heart to God. Wow. Instead, they say, well, I'm good. I don't need to do that. Well, I'm, I'm actually just even in listening to you say that, um, reminded of that scripture that will say, many will come to me in that day and say, Lord, Lord, I've healed the sick in your name. I've cast out demons in your name. Just because we're able to see miracles happen does not necessarily mean that God's blessing or anointing is on our lives. Because if he says, depart from me, I never knew you, it's interesting that someone that has never known God still has the ability to perform signs and wonders, which is, I mean, it is a scary 
thought, I'm thankful to the Lord that people are healed. And, and whether they're healed um, by someone who knows God or doesn't know God, the fact is they're healed because God loves those people. But it's not God endorsing someone's ministry simply because they have the ability to lay hands on the sick or to pray for the sick and see them recover, which just tells me how important it is that we don't look at the things that are outward. The Bible says man looks at the outward, God looks at the heart, and the Lord is looking for not people who can perform miracles as much as people who call him Lord and live to worship him because he didn't want his people to be in the wilderness to perform signs and wonders. He wanted his people in the wilderness to worship him him absolutely and i think you make a good point because you know we hear uh stories from the field and different ones where witch doctors are performing certain things and things are happening we have to recognize there is a supernatural power outside yeah. of god's of, of not his authority but his will yeah right? He is all supreme, all has all authority. Yeah. But we have to recognize that that's why it says in the New Testament we're to test the spirits. We've got to be mindful I love that it. just because there's something being paraded in front of us, it's not necessarily from God. Yeah. And really, over these next couple chapters, as you're seeing these signs and wonders that God is doing, you can make the case, and, and, and I think it's important to, to, to point out, many scholars point to this. I don't know exactly you know, where I land on this, but it is worth noting yeah. that each of the plagues, we have the first one in this next passage in chapter 7, where the waters turn to blood. Then you have the plague of the frogs and the lice or the gnats and the flies. Yeah. Each of these plagues correspond, if you look at it this way, to different Egyptian deities that were worshipped at the time. I mean, there's literal names here. The first plague is the water being turned to blood, and it's a sign. And we see that, if you look at uh, in kind of cultural studies, Osiris, one of the gods that was worshipped in Egypt, they believed that the Nile was actually his bloodstream. Amazing. He is Egypt. And so, could it be that God is challenging these spiritual, supernatural signs and wonders, these things that the Egyptians believe in, by saying, I am God over all these things. That's so good, bro. So in each of the plagues, which we obviously don't have time to go over in this, and friends, I want to encourage you to read it. If each of these plagues represent really kind of like this stronghold using Christianese language in Egypt, God is proving himself through everyone as the superior God, the one to be worshipped, not just so that Israel would know, but so the Egyptians would know. And to me, that is really a remarkable thing that God, look, John 3.16, for God so loved the world that he sent his son so that none would perish. In the same way that he sent his son as a deliverer, he's sending Moses as a deliverer to redeem his people out of Egypt, but also to reveal himself to the earth. Nathan, this is so awesome. I know we only have a few minutes, and I want to talk about the whole issue of the hardening of heart, if we can, as we close this. Friends, I've heard many, many times, even from some of my own friends and relatives, Scott, I'm going to live my life the way I want to live it, and on my deathbed, I'm going to turn to the Lord, and I'm going to accept the Lord, and and my heart at that time, I'll, I'll give Jesus a chance, so to speak. I've heard that from even some of my Jewish relatives. And my response has always been, listen, when we get to our deathbed, if we've rejected the Lord up until that time, our hearts are not going to be in a position to even ask him. And I see this where Pharaoh's concerned. You and I talked about this just a little bit a few minutes ago. But when it says that God hardened Pharaoh's heart, he did harden his heart. But it wasn't immediately. At the, at, the, at the outset of these plagues, it says that Pharaoh hardened his heart. Can you just talk about that for a minute? I think it's such a key point, and, and to be sensitive to time, let me just say this. God gives us the ability to make our choice. We see that throughout Scripture. Pharaoh, he, God tells Moses on the front end, I'm going to give these signs and wonders. Pharaoh is going to harden his heart, and then ultimately I'm going to use that to reveal myself and to set you free, as we'll see even in next week, to set you free not only from bondage, but I'm going to make the Egyptians favorably disposed towards you. They're going to want to bless you on the way out. Yeah. So 
<laughs> Why do I say that? Because I've heard the same thing. Well, Pharaoh didn't have a choice. Why would God do that? The first four or even five times, and I don't have it in front of you right away, but it's the first four or five times, it says that Pharaoh hardened his own heart. It's interesting, and, and just stop right there for a second. When Pharaoh hardened his heart, it seemed like his heart was pliable right. until things got better. It's like after the after the hardship was over, it says that Pharaoh hardened his heart. And it is that human nature. We, we're ready to repent. We're ready to make a change. We're going to stop with the addiction. We're going to break off the relationship that's been unfruitful until things get a little bit better. Yeah. And then we try to ride it out again. I, I think Pharaoh is an example that we all can identify with in that we, we're pliable until we feel like we can figure it out. Yeah. But with that, let me just say... God hardens his heart only after Pharaoh clearly demonstrates of his own free will what he desires. Yeah. He doesn't want to open his heart. And what Pharaoh ultimately does by hardening his heart continually, God finally says, much like we see in Romans chapter 1, yes. if you continually choose these things that are contrary to what I want for you, I will let you have them. And it's really God's mercy, because I firmly believe that even as God does that, it's ultimately to allow us to be resensitized to how much we really do need the Lord. Yeah. And in hardening our heart again, we might realize, you know what, this is not good for me. We see this in Romans chapter 1. Go ahead and read it, dude. Let me read a few, yeah. a few uh, passages from here. Uh, verse 20, for since the creation of the world, God's invisible qualities, his eternal power and divine nature have clearly been seen, being understood from what has been made so that people are without excuse. Meaning God's been revealing himself to us over and over and over. Verse 21, for although they knew God, they neither glorified him as God nor gave thanks to him, but their thinking became futile and their foolish hearts were darkened. Why? Although they claimed to be wise, they became fools and they exchanged the glory of the immortal God. For images made to look like mortal human beings, wow. birds, animals, and reptiles. And if you see the different Egyptian gods that are worshipped, there literally was a frog god. So yeah. it's no wonder that one of the plagues would be, I'm going to show you who's in charge of the frogs. You know, right, the, right. There was a god of the flies. And he says, you know what, let me show you what I can do with flies. I think it's a way to say, quit looking to lesser things. Yeah. I want you to realize I'm above all of this. And finally, Romans one twenty four. therefore God gave them over yeah. in the sinful desires of their hearts. Yeah. Bottom line, you harden your heart long enough. I believe the Lord will let us have what we quote unquote say we want. Yeah. But in his mercy, I believe it really is a tool to let us realize it's not really what I want. Yeah, I love that. You know, you may be listening today and uh, you're walking with the Lord. I think the encouragement for you is that in the midst of your battle, in the midst of your hardship, in the midst of the enemy seemingly turning up the, uh, the intensity of the trial, God wants, to, God wants to prove himself by coming down and fighting for you. You may be listening, and you may not believe that Jesus Yeshua is the Messiah. You may stumble on this podcast and, um, and listening today about this particular portion of Scripture, Exodus 6 through Exodus 9. And God's given you opportunities throughout your life to, to soften your heart. But each time situations get bad, you might ask people, hey, would you stand with me and would you pray for me? My husband's going through this or my wife's going through this. We pray God comes through, and then it seems like you forget about God again. Sometimes when we don't have an intimate, personal relationship with Jesus, we only want him to act for us in times when things are difficult. Friends, I want to encourage you, bow your knee today to the God of Israel, because if we increase hardening our hearts, if the pattern of our life is to cry out to God only when things are bad and forget him when things are good, there's going to come a day when our hearts will be hardened forever. Not because God is mean, but because we've set ourselves up in a particular way to not have our hearts pliable where the Lord is concerned. Nathan, thank you so much for joining us today. It's such a joy to have you, bro. It's such a privilege. I'm so grateful to interact with these things. And just pray blessings on those that are hearing you today. Amen. If, if this podcast has been a blessing, friends, please share it. Encourage your friends to download our app. And I look forward to coming back to you next week on this Portions podcast. 
Thanks so much for listening to our podcast today. For more information about Together for Israel and the work that we're doing in the land of Israel, please visit our website at www.togetherforisrael.org. We look forward to you joining with us next week on another Portions Podcast.